Okay, uh, good afternoon everybody, and uh, today's topic, timely topic, tonight and tomorrow is Rosh Chodesh Av, is the start of the month of Av. Av is a month, a tragic month for us, and with tonight's Rosh Chodesh we start what are called, or referred to as the Nine Days. Starting with Shavasa Batamas, the 17th day of Tamas, the three weeks began with increasing levels of, of, of a lut of mourning. And we make our way towards Tisha B'Av, which we'll soon discuss what happened historically then early on and later on and how it is meant to affect us today. Thank you so much, Dov. I really do appreciate that. Baruch ato Adonai, Elohim melech ha'olam, she'hakol miyah bevaro. Just, just before we go to our sources, just as an aside. So this tragic month is the month of Av. What does Av mean? What does it mean, Father? Father. Father. So why would... Sorry? Full name of the month? Is Av. We sometimes refer to it as Menachem Av. But the month is known as Av. Right? So why would this tragic month have the same name, the same word, as Av, as Father? Why would we connect tragedy to father. Linda, what do you have to say on that? Okay. Okay. The tragedies make us return even stronger to him. Any other ideas? So I would like to go in the, uh, in the opposite direction with that. Uh, okay. You know, I, I like to see these in a positive way, <laughs> right? So when a parent punishes, right, uh, disciplines, it is all out of love. love. And therefore, the name, not therefore, but perhaps... The name of this tragic month is there to remind us that these tragedies are the discipline of a parent, of a loving parent. You know, a a person is going through a tough time and then they peek behind the curtain and they see that it's their mother or it's their father who's orchestrating everything. All of a sudden you view it in a different manner. Oh, this is being orchestrated by someone who loves me dearly. Once we have that recognition, that understanding, we view it in a completely different way. And perhaps that's uh, an aspect of this tragic month being called Av. That once we focus on, it is our loving, loving parent who loves us more than we love ourselves that is orchestrating everything it gives us a completely different perspective. Excuse me, Menachem Av, does it change things when you add the Menachem? Menachem is to comfort. Oh, so you get So, that. So we're hoping that there will be this comfort for the tragedies that came about in this month okay. of Av. Okay. Yes, Dov? We have a very famous yard site. And that is Aaron Akoin, is it? Absolutely. Yeah. Who is um... the Oav Yisrael? Beautiful dove. Okay, so let's go to the earliest reference to Tisha B'Av, even though it's not necessarily reported as that date. But this is the event that did take place on that date, and it's from Bamidbar, the book that we are finishing this Shabbos. Vayotziu dibat haaretz. Asher Taru Osa, referring to the spies, they delivered an evil report. 
about the land Asher Toru Osa that they had uh, spied. And the result, the, the reaction of the, of the nation was Vatisa Kol Ha'eda Vayitnu et Kolam Vayivku Am Balayla Ha'hu the entire assembly raised their voices and cried, Balailahu. They cried on that night. As the brackets put in, why were they crying? They did not want to go and enter this land that was consuming its inhabitants, that was protected by giants, etc., etc. And Hashem said, Bamispar Hayamim Asher Tartim Equal, according to the amount of days that you spied out the land, Arba'im Yom, for 40 days, Yom Lishana, Yom Lishana, Tis'u et Avonotechem, Arba'im Shana. Right? A year for a day, a year for a day, you will carry this sin of yours, and we know that we remained in the desert for 40 years until that whole generation had died and only then did we enter into the land of Israel. This will happen on that night. What night is that night? Source number two, the Gemara Talmud Bavli, the Gemara in Tanit. Atem bechitem Bechia shel chinam, you cried a cry that was chinam, free, without a cause. Vani kovealachem bechia lidorot. I will establish for you a crying for generations. Now, at first glance, this sounds like an av that we would not want to emulate. Right? You're crying. I'll give you a reason to cry, right? Which is not necessarily uh, usually the best um, parenting approach when a parent says that. That usually is a sound, is the, an indication of someone uh, losing control a little bit and acting in a way that they might regret, hopefully, afterwards. So we'll need to get a better understanding in this. But the Bechia Lidorot, the crying for all generations, that Lailahu, that night was the night of Tisha B'Av. And the crying for all generations was that that night of Tisha B'Av was established as a tragic night, day, a tragic date on our Jewish calendar. And it is a time of Bechia Lidorot, of crying for generations. The night of the spies' report was Tisha B'Av, on this day that both temples were destroyed and many other tragedies took place throughout Jewish history. Let's start to get an understanding in, you cried, we'll have a reason to cry. The Maharal writes, V'zeh she'ama sh'ayubochim b'chiyah shel chinam Umasu be'eretz chemda. That that we said the Jews cried for nothing and despised this land of desire, this wonderful land of Israel. The davar zen nikva lahem dorot. This was then established, crying on this day for generations. Shayagoreim shegalu min ha'aretz. It was this crying, this initial crying, that led to us ultimately being exiled from the land. Even once we did enter the land, we were exiled once and then exiled again. Their crying, the Maral says, indicated that we did not have a complete connection to the land. If we felt, if we had this complete connection to the land, we would not have cried. Crying shows we don't have this complete connection. If we don't have this complete connection to the land, then our connection to the land will be incomplete. 
It'll be peppered with exile. We will not constantly be anchored there in this land. Rav Dessler takes us a step further. In source number four, Atem bechitem bechia shel chinam, you cried a cry for naught without cause. Lefichach ekva lechem bechia ludorot. I will therefore establish for you a crying for generations. Bechia hine bitui litzaar pnimi. Crying is an outward expression of an inner pain. What is this crying for naught, for free, for no reason? It comes from a lack of faith. When the children of Israel stood by the border of the Holy Land, they refused to enter, they resisted entering, saying, Amram, why has God brought us this land to fall by the sword? It's God's hatred for us that led him to take us out of Mitzrayim, to hand us over into the hands of these nations in order to destroy us. And this deficiency in our faith, in our trusting in God, which is something that's lacking internally, of our connection to God. It was not possible to correct this, only to rectify it only through this crying of the generations. And we'll understand that a little, a little better as we work our way on. Let me just point out for a moment, it's God's hatred for us. In psychology, you have a concept known as projection. Projection is you take your feelings and you project them onto another. And we were feeling this sin'a, this Hatred, this repulsion, this too much of an overwhelming presence of God. And when someone is in your face all the time, what do you want to do? Get out of there. Push back. Push back. And this was our projection of our feelings, our pushback that we were putting on to Hashem. Source number five was the Ne'er Le'elef booklet on Bamidbar and Shemot and Tisha B'Av. At that time, the Jewish people cried because they were too close to God and would continue to be so. And we discussed during the Parsha class this week the Avodazara, the idolatry of Baal Peor. Baal Peor was a depraved sort of idolatry. It was worshipped by performing bodily functions, urinating, defecating, on it, near it, in front of it. That's a sickening sort of worship. Yet we were drawn to Baal Peor, Vayitzamed, the Pasuk says. We clung closely, tightly to Baal Peor. Why is that? Well, Baal Peor represented a free-for-all, an absolute orgy, meaning that I, there's nothing, you know, people draw the line, right? You can joke, but don't joke about my mother. Don't joke about God. Don't, right? That we draw the line, because that's already, you're going too far. If a person can take their God and defecate all over it. That means that the nothing is sacred. And that means there's nothing that I can do that anyone can say, now you've gone too far. That's already cross, crossing the line. And therefore it allows for absolute freedom without there being any moral boundaries 
any restrictions of decency. I can do whatever I want. We clung to that because we were too close to God. I mentioned on Tuesday, someone has a video camera. It's one thing if it pans around, but it just stays on you, and wherever you go, it's on you, and it never leaves you, push back. We were too close to God, and would continue to be so. They felt that they could not continue in the land of Israel with the intense divine providence they had experienced in the desert. They'd rather go back and suffer under the Egyptians. God's response was, you'll get what you asked for. You want distance? You'll get that distance. But he assured them they would cry for generations. And their future cries would be not because they want the distance, but we would be crying because of that distance. As a result of that distance, they would see their temples destroyed and they would cry. Because of that distance, they would see their land taken over by others and they would cry in exile. That crying would be the right type of crying. Crying not because I want to get further, but crying because I want to get closer. And it would lead to where the original crying led away from. It would lead to return to the land and the ushering in of the Zman Mashiach, of the Messianic era. Let's go a little bit further back. The Mishnah tells us that there were five calamities that took place on Tisha B'Av. Chamisha Dvarim Iru Davotenu. Five things occurred on Tisha B'Av. And again, the nine days is the, the, the prelude as we lead into the ninth of the nine days, which is Tisha B'Av. Number one, as we just mentioned, Nigzal Avaseinu Shloikan Sula Aris. It was decreed upon our ancestors that they would not enter the land. They would die there in the Midbar. Bet. Charav Abayit Harbarishona, the first Beit Hamitash, the first temple was destroyed. Gimel, Ubashnia, the second temple was destroyed. Four, the Nilkita, Beitar, the city of Beitar was captured. Number five, the Nech Rasha Ha'ir, Jerusalem was plowed over. Yes, Steve. I know, celebrating, but commemorating, uh, let's say. Yes. Uh, observing, yes. Uh, so that's, that's something that, that it's important to pay attention to. Yes, absolutely. That's a source of, of, of information about the absolutely. Fasting. absolutely, absolutely. So actually there are two different, seemingly contradictory sources about the destruction of the first temple. Yes, Ida, I'm sorry. Oh, um... I would think that there would be some recommendation or law that says you should not conduct business on Tisha B'Av because it would seem to me that that there would be something wrong going on if you conducted business. It would yeah. not be a day where anything could go right. Correct. And also, a actually, how I, I, can you have business as usual at Tisha B'Av? hundred percent. There are two sides there. hundred percent. And actually, we say that the entire month of Av, yeah. if you're going to be having a, uh, a court case with a non-Jew, best to uh, delay it. Right? right? Delay it till after that month. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Let's look at the sources from the Prophets. Of course, the first temple was built by Shlomo HaMelech, and therefore it, right, and its destruction 
are all spoken about by the prophets. The second temple, we have the building of it in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, right, as we return to Israel after the Babylonian exile, the destruction of that temple took place already after the close of prophecy, and therefore it's not in our Tanakh. But let's look at the first Beit HaMikdash. The Pasuk in Malachim, Kings, says, Ubechodesh HaChamishi, in that fifth month, or the month of Av, Be'esor, I'm sorry, Beshiva LaChodesh, in the seventh of the month, in the 19th year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, Ba Nubuzradan Rav Tavachim came Nubuzradan, who was the chief executioner, Eved Melech Bavel, the servant of the king of Bavel, he came to Yerushalayim, Vayisrof et Beit Hashem, and he burnt the house of God that Beit HaMelech and the palace of the king, that called Bata Yerushalayim and all the houses of Jerusalem, that called Bayit Gadol and every Bayit Gadol, the Gemara debates, is a Bayit Gadol a Beit Knesset, a synagogue, or is it a Beit Medrash, a study hall? But all of that, Saraf Be'esh, he burnt with fire. And that says it happened on which day? The seventh, not the ninth. The Navi Yir Miyahu, who is the author of Echa, that which, uh, that which is scheduled to be read a week from this Saturday night, he writes, Uvachodeshamishi, and on the fifth month, Besor La Chodesh, on the tenth of the month, he shnat shas bavel. Which is the 19th year of the reign of the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. Ba Nebuzradan, what the Amalekh Amalekh Babel Yishulayim. Came Nebuzradan, the chief executioner, and stood before the king, the Babylonian king in Jerusalem. Ba Yisrov Beit Hashem, and he burned the house of Hashem at Beit Hamel, the Kolbat Yishulayim, the Kolbat Yagadol Sarof Peish. Again, the house of our God, the palace, houses, and law, and great houses, right? House of the dignitaries. Fair enough. He burned. So how do we resolve this? Uh, you mean was it the seventh? Well, the fires stayed for several days. Okay, was it the seventh? Was it the tenth? Well, right. The so the Gemara, died. of course, jumps all over this. Right. I, right. I've said I've said a number of times. Right. This is something that I heard from uh, Rabbi Jeff Stern, which I think uh, one of my Talmudim, which is an, an excellent point that he made. You know, if the Torah is something that was not what it claims to be. If it wasn't God's word to Moshe, but rather at a later point, some different scholars, they got together and they wrote these accounts, right, presenting it as God said to Moses, but I don't know if he did, I don't know if he said that, I don't know if he said exactly that, something along those lines, right, but we're going to present it as God said to Moses. Right? The last thing that you want to do is tell people, right, if I want to get into a uh, club with my fake ID over here, right, so what do I do? Not from any experience. Right? So you go, you flash the ID, and then you put it into your pocket. The last thing you do is hand it to the person and say, please, examine this with a, that blue light of yours, right? and a magnifying glass. And then compare it to every other license of every other, everyone else who's come and showed you their license. Right? It's the last thing that you do. Yet we find what is the greatest mitzvah of the Torah? Which mitzvah do we say is keneged kulam is equal to all the other mitzvahs? Talmud Torah. Studying Torah is keneged kula. So if I'm trying to pass off a forgery, the last thing I'm going to do is tell them, tell everybody, study it. For all generations, study it, compare it, understand it, delve into it, take out a microscope and see everything about it. So here, the Malachim, in Malachim it says the seventh, in Yirmiyot it says the tenth, 
The Gemara says, "Ef Shaloma b'Shiva shekvar nemar b'Asor." Ef Shaloma b'Asor shekvar nemar b'Shiva. Right? You can't say the tenth. It says the seventh. You can't say the seventh. It says the tenth. Ha Kate said, "What do we do with this?" B'Shiva, on the seventh, Nich Nisu Necharim Lehechal. That is when they entered into the temple. Ba'achlu, and they ate. V'Kilkulu. And they desecrated there, Shvi'i, Shmini, Chi'i, on the seventh and eighth day, Uchi on the ninth day, Samuch Luchashecha, when it was almost darkness night, Hitzitu Boet Ha'or, that's when they lit it on fire. Vayadolek Vaholech Kol Hayom Kulo, and it continued to burn, Kol Hayom Kulo that entire day of the 10th. That is why in usual years, when the fast is not pushed off, so we maintain some aspects of our aveilut, of our mourning, through until chatzot, midday of the 10th of Av. Right? That include haircuts, laundering, things like that. Even meat and, even meat and wine. But this year, why? Because there's actually a debate in the Gemara, when should, tish, when should the fast be? The Rabbanan said the ninth. Others said the tenth. Most of the burning took place on the tenth. The reason why it's on the ninth, though, is the Gemara says, Atchalata de Puranuta, the start of the tragedy, yeah. is what we focus on. Therefore, we fast on the ninth, and maintain a little bit on the 10th. However, this year, where the 9th of Av falls out on Shabbos, and therefore the fast gets pushed off until the 10th of Av, so once it ends, right, the next morning there is no lingering um, restraints that remain afterwards, right, because of that reason. So the Gemara is explaining that it went from the 7th until the 10th. Each one of these uh, books of prophecy are discussing a different aspect. In Malachim, we're discussing the start of this process of the burning of the, of the Heichal. And in uh, and Yirmiyahu Anavi is discussing the main actual burning that took place. That's the first Beit HaMikdash. Source number 10. The destruction of the Second Temple in the year 70 CE. What does CE stand for? Common error. Mm, common error. <laughs> Came long after the end of the biblical period, right? So it is not described in the works of the prophets. It's after the period of prophecy. Nevertheless, Jewish tradition has preserved for us the details of its destruction. Source number 11, again, the Gemara Ta'anit, the Gemara titled Fasts, Fast Days. Uvishni Aminalam, so the Mishnah in Ta'anit had said the first base on Mikdash and the second base on Mikdash. And it brought the sources that we quoted above for the first base on Mikdash. The Gemara asks, Uvishni Aminalam, how do we know the second base on Mikdash was destroyed on that same date? Titania, as we learn. Megalgalin zuchut liyom zakai v'chova liyom chayav. God brings good things to come about on. He orchestrates that good things will happen on days that are good and tragedies will happen on days that are ominous. Yes. If a person is fasting, they're not and a brit is a celebration. When is the brit held? The brit will be on the eighth day. Rabbi Perry's no son. No matter what. Yeah. Yeah. We you won't have. We have won't have. We won't have a seuda until that night. night. But the bris, like on Yom Kippur. Yeah. Or Yom Kippur, which is Shabbos. Oh, that you can. I know. Yeah. Yeah. So we don't. We won't push off. The Torah says the eighth day, and the Torah reiterates the eighth day. It lets us know eighth day. Eighth day, no matter what. The Su'uda, the festive meal, would have to be delayed. Rabbi, we had a rabbi, Rabbi Perez, 
and his youngest son was at the bris. There was no food. It was very calm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You say Jews are not calm when we're, when we're around food? Is that what you're implying? <laughs> well, it, um, it took away from the <laughs> celebration. Somewhere. They said, Kishkar Beis HaMikdash Buri Shona. When the first base of Mishra was destroyed, Oto Ayom Erev Tisha B'Av Haya. That day was the night of Tisha B'Av, Umot Shabbat Haya. And it was a Saturday night, Umot Shviat Haita. And it was the year following the Shemitah sabbatical year, Umishmar Tashel Yehoyariv Haita. There were different shifts of Kohanim. Each koan, each shift would serve a week in the base Hamikdash. Okay? Valivim ay omim shira vaomdin al duchanam. The Levim were saying that were singing their Levite songs, standing by their altar in the place, well, standing in the place where they would stand for their singing. Umash shira yomim. Which song were they saying? Vayashav aleim et onam. Uvratam yatsmiyem, yatsmitem, excuse me. Hashem brought upon them their sins, and because of their evil, they were cut off. Below is speakam, speakam lomar, yatsmitem. Hashem alokeinu. They did not have enough time to say, Hashem, our God, will cut them off. Ad shebon necharim vechavshum vechem vishniya. Right? Until they were completely overrun there. And the same thing applied also, Bishnia, the same Gemara, the Gemara says, that was a tragic day, so God orchestrated that that other tragedy also took place on that day. The fourth thing mentioned, so we mentioned there, the Mishnah, Tainus, mentioned, number one, we cro- it, was de- it was decreed not to enter the land. Number two, First base of is destroyed. Number three, second base of is destroyed. Number four, Nilkita Beitar, the destruction of Beitar. Although not directly connected to the destruction of the second temple itself, the destruction of the city of Beitar by the Romans 65 years later marked the final blow. The failure of the Bar Kokhva revolt and the period of persecution initiated by the Roman Emperor Hadrian served to deepen the exile that had begun with the destruction of the temples. This was taking it all a step even further. Lastly, number five was the temple site was plowed over on 135 CE. The Mishnah Brura, that's the Chafetz Chaim's uh, writings on the Shulchan Aruch, on the Code of Jewish Law, writes, Ubo biyom muchan lepuranut, and on that day that was designated for punishment, Harash Tornus Rufus Harash et Heichal Vetzivivav. He plowed up the Heichal, the area of the temple and the surrounding area. Lekayei Mashenemar, thereby fulfilling the chilling prophecy, which was Tzion Sadeh Techerash. Tzion, Zion, will be plowed over like a field. Very famous Gemara. One of the reasons why it's very famous because it's a very, very important and impactful Gemara. Also because it's the very last part of a Gemara. So whenever a person makes a siyum, when you complete a tractate, you read over that last portion. And it happens to be the last portion of the tractate of Makot, which is one of the shorter tractates of the Talmud. So if someone wants to make a siyum, but doesn't want to bite off too much, they'll often learn makot. So we hear the story of Rabbi Akiva and other sages who were walking along, and they came to the point of where the Beit HaMikdash had stood, and they saw a fox running through the destroyed area of what had been the Kodesh Kadashim, the Holy of Holies. And the other rabbis all started to cry. And Rabbi Akiva started to laugh. And they said to Rabbi Akiva, Akiva, why are you laughing? And he said to them, why are you crying? And they said, why are we crying? The place about which it was written that a non-Kohen dares to enter that area of the Holy of Holies 
It's punishable by death. And now foxes are running through. And how can we not cry? But why are you laughing? And he said, Bishvil Kach, that's why I'm laughing. Because there's a prophecy about the destruction and there's a prophecy about the rebuilding that will take place that will even eclipse the original building and the destruction. So until I saw the fulfillment of the first prophecy, I was not as close to the fulfillment of the second prophecy. Now that I've seen the first prophecy fulfilled, I know the second one will also be fulfilled. And they said, and the, the concluding words of the tractate are, Akiva nichamtanu. Akiva nichamtanu. Akiva, you have comforted us. Akiva, you have comforted us. Rabbi Wein says the Temple Mount still bears the stamp of Hadrian's plows. After 135 CE, source number 14, when the Bar Kokhba rebellion was crushed, Hadrian acted even more ruthlessly and set about on a campaign to wipe out not only the remnants of the Jewish people, but the memory that they had ever existed. In effect, he decided to solve the Jewish problem once and for all. He realized that the final solution to the Jewish problem lay not in killing Jews, but in destroying Judaism. As long as the Jews had their religion, no one would ever be able to really be able to eradicate them entirely. Therefore, he issued decrees that outlawed Judaism on the pain of death. The decrees of Hadrian were the most fearsome in history against the Jewish people. He did not stop there. He forbade mention of the name Jerusalem and renamed the holy city Elia Capitolina. He also forbade Jews from living there. Most notable of all, he employed an army of slaves to plow over, plow over and plow down the temple mount. Let's come back for one more layer of understanding of how we began with that Bechia Lidorot, will cry for all generations. So first, number 16, the Gemara again, Talmud Bavli, now in Sanhedrin. The Pasuk says, Lo yumtu avot al banim. The father should not be put to death because of the children. Ma tamiloma, what does that mean? What does it come to teach us? Imla made shlo yumtu avot ba'avon banim, uvanim ba'avon avot. If it's coming to say that a father won't be held responsible for this, for this children's sins, nor will this children be held responsible for the father's sins. Hare kvar nemar. It already says that explicitly. Ish becheto you matu. Every man will only die for every person for their own acts. El lo yutu avot al banim. What this means here, the parents will not die based on the edut banim, based on the testimony of the sons. A son can't be the witness against the father. And parents cannot serve as witnesses to testify against their children. The Gemara says, are you telling me the children will not die, will not suffer the consequence of their parents' sins? Isn't it written Pokei avon avot al banim. In no less an important place than the Ten Commandments, it speaks about pokei avon avot al banim, right? Visiting the sins of the parents onto the children. The Gemara says hatam. That's talking about kisha ochazin maase avotehen biadehen when they are following in the ways emulating the missteps of the parents, that is when they will be involved in that. And Rabbi Leo Kitov, in his beautiful Sefer Todaah, explains as follows. We'll just take it straight into the English. Atem bechitem, you cried for no reason. I will establish this as bechia 
lidorot, as crying for generations. Kulum no kein vino kero kosh baruchu bal chema. Right? God is not vengeful. He is not angry. Ve'od elador machatu. And what did these later generations do? The children of those who accepted the sin, who accepted the slander about the land of Israel, they needed to wait 40 years. Their parents died, they needed to wait 40 years. Isn't that sufficient? And if later generations we were exiled because of that, Ma'akesher, what is the connection between the sins of the fathers and the punishment of the sons that is decreed that this will be on the day that their fathers had sinned, on the ninth of Av? Why are the kids responsible? Why are we responsible? Why on Tishba are we crying? Why do we have to cry because of the misstep of so many generations back. Ella, kachu metzahadvarim. This is the explanation. Ba'avom lechia shel zu shachinam lo gzogosh baruchu b'midbar zeh yitamu ela avot shechatu. Punishment for the senseless weeping that was on those who wept. They will die in the wilderness. Those who had the senseless weeping will have to deal with the consequences. Vabanim and the children who did not sin, Bo La'aretz, they came to the land via Yashua and they inherited it. Toma Shabanim Nukim Yavon Zesh, Kapia Tov, Mikol Vakol, Velokol Kokosh Alaav, Bibino. Although the children, it's bolded over here, had not evidenced their father's trait of ingratitude, it was nevertheless part of their makeup. A father's influence finds expression in the children. Achain, therefore, lo yintu abonim avot. We did not, the children did not die because of the sin of the fathers. But, God labored, so to speak, for the children, to eradicate this aspect of the fathers that had been, become part of the makeup of the children. Because in place of the fathers rejecting the precious land, saying, let us return to Mitzrayim. So the children will be able to correct this by crying, weeping in the generations that will come follow. When we would cry in all the lands that we were spread out to, cry over the land that was destroyed, even when we're living comfortably, peacefully, nevertheless, we're still crying over the land. It's amazing. Yesterday, Daniel, uh, Agris, and I spent first with the city, right, the person in charge of the different components of the city maintenance and the person who's in charge of the roads and the trees and the person who is the main contractor that they hire to trim the trees. So we spent about three hours, hopefully as we're talking now, this Erev is getting fixed. We hope we'll be up by this Shabbos. Right? That's a short-term fix until we can make changes that we won't constantly have the problems that we have. But I walked away saying, what a blessing that we live in this country, in this county, in this city, where they were so attuned to helping us to catering to our needs 
of the Eruv. And they didn't just say, listen, we can't do it, but they were, and especially one fellow, he was so fascinated, so explain to me again, so what are the, what are the parameters? You know, can it be like, does it matter what gauge the string is? Right? Can there be a sagging? Can it touch? You know, he was so attuned to our needs. It was, it was, it was really incredible. But nevertheless, when we're in a land that gives us all of this, nevertheless, what do we do? We cry about Israel. We cry about the destroyed Beit HaMikdash. Lo yishkechu et artsam. With all of these blessings, we don't forget our land. V'yivko alea b'chi emet. And we cry a true cry. V'yazilu dima. And tears flow. Al eretz chareva. About our destroyed land. V'yishtokeku la'alot. And we desire, we yearn to ascend. U'lechonein afra and to rebuild it even b'sham muta in its desolate state, emor meyata. So therefore, that is the way that 